Hi, I'm Darren, and welcome to Level Up Double Lab. Today's episode is part three in my series of how to build a small amateur radio receiver. I'll go through in detail how I chose the bandpass filter designs and show the simulation results, show off my printed circuit board designs, and walk through the 3D model of the final assembly. Well, here I am, episode three. Thanks for sticking with me on this series. And if you missed the first two episodes, you should go back and watch those first. Otherwise, you're probably going to be a little confused about what I'm going through here today. And I want to continue thanking Jim Fork and Amateur Call Sign WA3TFS. It's his work that I'm building on in this series. Now, where I left off in the second episode was talking about bandpass filters, and that's what we're going to dive into today. I began the bandpass filter design by studying Jim's version for the 40 meter band. This filter topology is called constant K, and it has some distinct advantages. Namely, they're easy to design and model mathematically, they have very low insertion loss, and their stop band tails don't plateau, ignoring self-resonance effects, of course. Some key disadvantages include their attenuation slopes are quite shallow as compared to other designs, and they can't be designed narrower than about 10% of their center frequency at frequencies greater than about 10 MHz. That's because the center inductor in the shunt branch becomes absurdly small. So those limitations give them a fairly small window of use in the amateur radio spectrum. An alternative and more commonly used topology for HF bandpass filters are Butterworth designs, more specifically the double-tuned circuit version, or DTC. These are well characterized. In fact, the EMRFD book and other handbooks have standard tables and formulas like these that make component selection for DTC Butterworth filters easy. Of course, Butterworth designs also have their own inherent strengths and weaknesses that I won't get into great detail here, but one plus is they do have much steeper roll-off skirts than Constant K, with one minus being that they aren't well suited for wide bandwidths. All those factors considered, a Constant K design is a good choice for the 40 meter band. I could have used Jim's design as is, but I played around with a few scenarios in Excel and LT Spice, and what I've decided to do is reconfigure the inductor and cap values a bit to tighten the bandwidth. This does require an 82 nanohenry inductor for the shunt branch, which is not practical to make from a toroid, so I'll be using a fairly high Q SMT inductor for it. Moving down the scale to the 80 meter band, its 500 kilohertz bandwidth is about 13% of the center frequency, which is just too large to cover in its entirety with a Butterworth filter without having excessive insertion losses. So I'm going with this constant K design, which I've made pretty narrow. The maximum insertion loss in the pass band is 1.5 dB. Any narrower and the loss will be too much at the ends. If you haven't built a filter before, you might be thinking that eh, it's as simple as just plugging numbers in a spreadsheet and ordering parts and building it up and calling it a day. I am really glossing over a lot of the art that's behind uh, constructing these filters. And as you'll see when I get into the next few bands, there are some more trade-offs to start to creep in. 160 meters is tricky. Laying out a constant K filter with minimal insertion loss with 200 kilohertz of bandwidth is easily done. Here it is on the left-hand side of my LT spy screen. However, right away you can see a problem with that shallow left tail slope. At 1700 kHz, which is the upper limit of the AM broadcast band, the constant K filter has essentially zero attenuation. And with that shallow tail slope, pretty much every sports news and talk radio station above about 1200 kHz will march right through this filter and make annoying heterodynes in the first mixer. So instead I went with the DTC Butterworth design shown here on the right. It's plotted to the same scale as the constant K filter. I biased its center frequency slightly to the lower end of the band, which is a good compromise since that's typically where most of the action is. But even with that bias, the much steeper tail slope still yields a tolerable 12 dB of attenuation at 1700 kHz. I've configured the rest of the bandpass filters as DTC Butterworth designs. Nothing particularly challenging about it, but I did try to reuse common toroids and I kept the caps to the E24 series wherever possible. 
I also plan for inserting a trimmer in parallel with the shunt caps to allow for some fine tuning. Let's talk now about the physical construction of the filters. I said in prior videos that I wanted a modular construction and here's what I came up with. There'll be rectangular PCB strips 14 millimeters wide by 57 and millimeters long. That's more room than is really needed because I'm leaving a little extra length to accommodate a triple tune circuit filter in case I want to try those out in the future. These are really small, so to make insertion and removal more robust, I've designed this two-piece clip that's much easier to grip and hold steady while pushing and pulling on them. I'll 3D print these and use number three size hardware to sandwich a pair to either side of a filter PCB. Note that this design directs the forces right over the headers. That's important to minimize bending of the filter PC board. Also note that I'm orienting the caps perpendicular to the long axis of the PC board. That plus using the clip will minimize bending strain that might crack the caps. If you've ever experienced cracking problems on MLCCs due to excessive strain, then you know exactly what I'm afraid of. I've got the first pair of clips that I 3D printed right here, and I am pretty happy with how these turned out. Like most things when you design in 3D and actually get them in the real world, so to speak, they look a lot smaller than they do on screen. One thing I did kind of gloss over, and I'll try to get this on camera here if I can get them to focus and not focus on my eyes, are those uh, two little loops at the top. And I'm going to use those along with some uh, wire ties to hold the tops of the toroids to provide some additional mechanical support. Here's the completed receiver PC board design. It's a double-sided board with a ground plane on the top along with all the through-hole components. Surface mount components and almost all the traces are on the back side. I've tried to keep the ground plane as contiguous as possible and kept all the digital and power conditioning stuff geographically separate from the RF stuff. I thought about having a star ground connection between the RF and digital, but ultimately didn't go that route. So hopefully I made the right choice here. It's 117 by 90 millimeters, which is quite a bit smaller than the 200 by 150 millimeter blank board that I showed in the prior episode. So I definitely overachieved here. Let's follow the schematic. First up is the RF input here on the left hand side. I've got two input spots. One goes through the bandstop filter if I decide to include it. The other input spot bypasses the filter. Next is the RF preamp and then the large space in this region is for holding the three selectable bandpass filters and the four Omron relays. Flipping it over we can see the rest of the RF stages including the mixers, 9 MHz crystal filter and the IF amps. The amount of space the RF portion takes is pretty small. Most of the geography on this board is for the bandpass filters, the nano, and the SI5351 frequency module. I've packed the components as tightly together as I'm comfortable hand soldering, and by sheer coincidence the final size will fit nicely in my chosen case that I'll show in a moment. But I have to show you what I started with. There's no auto router or component placing automation in KiCad. It just dumps everything in a scrum about the origin and lets you have all the fun pulling it apart and laying it out. But I really do enjoy PC board layout. It's a unique form of puzzle solving. There's something therapeutic about it too, that's for sure. No offense to those who do it for a living. Clearly I'm a rank amateur and I'm not working in rigid timelines, but this is one of my favorite activities. Here's the completed audio PC board. And boy, what this design needs is more electrolytic caps. Said no one ever. Seriously, there are 11 of them on this board. You can barely see the four trimmer pots because of them. I guess I could have used some tantalums for most of them, but oh well, maybe in version 2.0. This board will mount above the receiver board, and in a moment I'll show how that works. Now for the case. I have this nice aluminum case that I got off of Amazon, but after I ordered it, I realized it was just too big. Here's a printout of the receiver PC board to scale, and it would just swim inside it. Also, just look how tiny the 1.8 inch display would be on the front panel. So I'll save this guy for a future project. Rummaging through my junk box, I found this little beauty that I scored at a ham fest last summer. Good old Archer quality. Seriously though, it isn't that bad. Both halves are nicely painted, and it does have ventilation slots. Back to the coincidence that I mentioned earlier. Here's that same PC board printout, and look how well it fits inside it. 
Almost like I designed it that way from the start, eh? Anyway, this looks like it'll work nicely. Here's what all the big pieces look like when modeled to scale. As you can see, the receiver board is on the bottom and the audio board will sit above it on standoffs. There's plenty of room for the three filter modules, although it will be a bit tight to get the front panel controls and the wiring in place. I'm going to try and squeeze a small speaker in here too once I build a 3D model of it and check it out. I'm not yet satisfied with this control layout. I want the 1.8 inch display to be prominent and have the six controls spaced logically. I'm still playing around with it and also playing around with knob design. I'll be 3D printing those so I can freely design them however I want. I'm also planning to design and print a bezel around the display to hide any mounting fasteners. For the graphics on the front panel, because it's a flat surface, I'm planning to design and print a water slide decal and clear coat it. That's what I did for my Mr. Carlson Super Probe that I built a year ago, and it looks really good. Yep, the amplifiers in my probe do go to 11. I'd have to say I'm pretty satisfied with the progress on this project so far. So what's next? Well, I have ordered and received all of the components. That's one of the things I typically do on a project before I commit to a final printed circuit board 3D design. That way I can check all the parts and make sure that I didn't make any mistakes with their sizes and you know have some interferences or have parts that don't line up with the pad um, geometry on the board. So that's past all the checks there. So I'm ready to commit to the final printed circuit board construction. Now I will be ordering the receiver board. Typically I make all my own printed circuit boards, but in this case that's just too complex of a board and I did deliberately add a, a lot of fine pitch features there knowing from the get-go I was going to order it just to be able to make it more compact and actually make it perform better in a few areas. So it typically takes about three weeks to get a board like that made. And in the meantime, I've got the board I'm going to be making for the audio section and all of the bandpass filter boards. So that'll keep me busy for sure. And in parallel with all that, I've got the software for the Arduino. Now I've started working on that a few days ago, mainly to make sure that there was going to be enough memory available for all of the code. And it's looking good so far. And that will be the subject of the next video. So I hope you've enjoyed watching this series so far. And until next time, bye for now.